Hey, one, how's it going? What's up? It's about, it's about 115, so uh, I guess we can get started. Oh, sorry, 1115. Oh, it's early. I had to get up early to get here. Um, before we get started, I just want to say that this is like this is legit my very first panel at any convention. So the fact that like this many people showed up to somewhat to, to this, I just want to say thank you. And hope you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Hope, hopefully, nothing goes wrong at all. Like just nothing and. and <laughs> Oh, whoops. I forgot to take that out. No, in all serious. Hello, everyone, and welcome to First It Was Anime, Then It Was Not, a history of retro anime video game alterations. And yes, they actually did manage to play. My name is William. I run a website called 2-2.com. If you never he heard of it, that's okay. Most people haven't. Um, it's a website that likes to talk about anime and video games, so naturally for a panel, I decided to do one based on anime video games. I... Uh, I want to start off with a, a little story about a game I own called Dragon Power. Now, in this game, it's for the Nintendo Entertainment System. You, tr it's an action adventure game. You travel along these different lands, fighting bad guys. You play as this ninja guy that you saw on the cover of the game. Uh, you're joined by this uh, woman named what? Nora. Nice mouth. Yes, it's it's, it's great, and. Uh, occasionally you meet some crazy characters like this, this pig person named Pudgy. And uh, you fight this, uh, this thief-looking guy named Lancer. And, and uh, Lancer is joined by this flying cat. And you have to go around collecting these things called the dragon crystals. Huh. And, huh, you know, now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure the main character's name in this game is Goku. Where have I heard this before? Oh, that's why. Because in Japan, it's, tr it's a Dragon Ball game. Uh, yes, this is the very first Dragon Ball game released for the Famicom. Um, when Bandai brought it over to the US, they changed it because at the time, Dragon Ball was not popular in the US, or even really known in the US. It was the late 80s, and you know, it wasn't until Toonami that Dragon Ball had any sort of uh, no, uh, presence in the US. Um, in the original game, Goku actually looks like Goku. He has spiky hair as opposed to the bowl cut that the original, that the, that the uh, American version has. And uh, mo all the characters, they have name changes and various scenes were changed for uh, a few reasons. My personal favorite is one involving Master Roshi. The game features the early episodes of the series and for those of you familiar with the original Dragon Ball, there's a scene where Master Roshi says that he'll give Bulma his Dragon Ball if he gets to see her undergarments. And there's even a whole cutscene where uh, the, those undergarments that you see, they're spinning around, and he's like, oh, that's great. Um, that didn't stay in the American version. Instead, it looks like this. <laughs> so yes, that's supposed to be Master Roshi. He got the, the most drastic change out of all the characters. And those are supposed to be sandwiches. <laughs> so, cause, they look yeah. like pyramids. No, they're, trust me, they're supposed to be sandwiches. Because in the cutscene, he specifically tells... Nora, turnovers! They're turnovers. Yeah. They're, they're like, hey, I'll give you my Dragon Ball for a sandwich. Because apparently, in this version, Master Roshi doesn't have food in his house. <laughs> yeah, so it's so bizarre. That's a fair grade. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is what the Kamehameha, Kamehameha is called in the US version. The Wind Wave. Yep. Which, which is funny because if you've seen the cinematic masterpiece that is Dragon Ball Evolution, you might remember that in that movie they described the Kamehameha as a move where you move the wind instead of like an energy blast. So it makes me wonder if someone from Fox played this game and just assumed, oh, well, clearly this is accurate to the source material. <laughs> let's call it, let's, let's base it on that. Now, the funny thing about this game is that it actually was released on the NES but only in France. <laughs> because cause at the time, Dragon Ball was known in France, so they kept the name. And um, it wouldn't be until 1997 that an actual Dragon Ball game would make it over to North American shores in the form of Dragon Ball GT Final Bout for the PlayStation 1. Now obviously these days, like 
pretty much every Dragon Ball game makes it over to the U.S., including a few that probably shouldn't have. <coughs> Saga. Dragon Ball Connect. Sagas. <laughs> Sagas. <laughs> yeah, that one too. Um, but yeah, so uh, that's that's Dragon Ball Power. That's that's Dragon Power for you. So so what's going on here? You see, back in the eighteen and uh, sorry, the eight and sixteen bit days of video games, uh, you know, companies would make games based on anime properties and release them in Japan. But the problem is, is that during that time, there was very few anime titles that were that made it over here to our shores. So, you know, and and when in order to bring these games over, you have to pay a separate license because licenses are based on a region to region basis in, in, in most cases. So, you know, why would these companies spend money on a license for a property that's not known in the country that they're releasing it in? And compared to you know more uh, more advanced uh, games these days with you know, 3D models and all that stuff, changing sprites and and you know providing localization to the small amount of text most of these games have didn't cost as much money as it would cost these days to to localize them. So when they wanted to bring a title over, they just thought, eh, you know, we'll just change it up a little bit, try to sell it as its own original property, such as this next game. So, <laughs> Dragon Power is actually part of a trilogy of games that Bandai brought over to the U.S. that were based on anime properties and were changed in the U.S. Um, this one's a little more obvious. Uh, this is Tag Team Match Muscle. And this is... Oh, oh what the heck happened there? Sorry about that. Uh, this is a... Uh, Muscle, for those of you who don't know, is a very, very simplistic wrestling game where you walk around, you punch, you bounce off the ropes and you can fly in the air like that. That's the most interesting thing in the entire game. Occasionally, you get to do a super move, and that's it. Most people consider it pretty bad. I paid $5 for it, so I think it's okay for $5. But, you know, it, it doesn't take a genius to figure out which one, what this game is based on. It is, in fact, Kanika Man, tagged, uh, muscle tag team match. Stan Hansen. What's, what's interesting about this, and just can you command in general back in the, the 80s and 90s, um, you might recognize it, might recognize its sequel series, Ultimate Muscle More, because that anime actually made it over here. Uh, the original anime uh, didn't, um, because, well, you know, it's a bit violent, um, uh, for, for the 80s at least. You know, it had some uh, adult humor, so they didn't bring over the anime. But they did bring over something that was possibly way more profitable than the anime ever was, you know, at least at the time. Toys. Lots and lots of toys. Basically, they took the Kaneki Man toys and they renamed them as Muscle, which stood for millions of unusual small creatures lurking everywhere. There were these little small fig wrestling figures that you can collect. Uh, most of them actually kept the same name that they, they had in Japan and you know, you can, you can you battle with them, they're not very big, and you had like you know, a few accessories like a wrestling ring and, and stuff like that. And in addition to bringing over the toys, they brought over the video game. Uh, but there's one major difference. Like, for the most part, the game is similar to its Japanese counterpart, but they removed one character from the Japanese pers uh, version, and that is uh, Brockin Jr. And they replaced, it, uh, replaced him with Geronimo, uh, a different character from the series. Now, you might be wondering, why would you replace a German with a Native American? <laughs> That's a legit question. Um, I, have, I have a pretty good idea why you would do that. <laughs> but he's so good with children! I, I know, I know. Look, this might sound crazy, but like, in the 80s, people might have thought that portraying a Nazi as a good guy might not have been a good idea in the U.S. Um, look, I yeah, I, I know, I know. Um, other than that, there's not a terrible lot uh, to talk about with this game. Like I said, it's very similar, but it's a, the, the change of character is a very funny anomaly uh, between the two versions. Uh, for those of you who are interested, in uh, Kaneki Command or Ultra Muscle games in this case. There were, uh, to my knowledge, three Ultra Muscle games that were released in the US. Uh, first up is Ultra Muscle Path of the Superhero for the Game Boy Advance. Then there was also Galactic Wrestling featuring Ultimate Muscle for the PlayStation 2. And my personal favorite, Ultimate Muscle Legends vs. New Generation for the Nintendo GameCube. Uh, for those of you wrestling fans who are fans of WWF No Mercy, 
Made by the same guys. Really good really? game. Really? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is made by Aki. Uh, a really good game, really fun, and has super cool power moves. And even more interesting, this game actually has references to muscle in it. So, fun little fact. So, to, co to round out the Bondi trilogy, as it were, we're going to talk about another game called Chubby Cherub. Um, funny enough, this is also considered one of the worst games for the NES. Um, in this game, you play as a Cupid character uh, who has to fly around, you gotta eat food, and you gotta avoid a whole bunch of enemies, including dogs. Like, you see that dog? Stay away from that dog. The dog's evil. <laughs> dog's very evil. Yeah. Uh, uh, look. It looks cute. No, don't, don't let his exterior fool you. <laughs> Shoot the dog! That is a cold-blooded killer. Just like the dog can buy the walk um, I played the game. You don't need to play the game. <laughs> but it was originally an anime game, uh, specifically Jutaro the Ghost. Now, okay, just out of curiosity, how many people have actually heard of this series? Uh, well, you, I expect you to. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, just that's what I thought. Um, yeah, Jutaro the Ghost was an anime series. It ran in Japan in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, to my understanding. Um, it's about a mischievous ghost who hung out with kids and got into crazy antics. Um, it never made it to the U.S., so, you know, kind of justified in replacing him. Uh, this is basically what the game looked like uh, in Japan. Um, very similar, a lot more dogs, gotta avoid them. Um, if you're wondering why dogs are such a bad thing, it's because in the anime, uh, Kitaro is afraid of dogs. Apparently, that's a thing that ghosts are afraid of. I don't know. I've never seen this show, to be honest. So, yes, moving on. All right, we're actually going to do things a little bit backwards for this one. We're going to, we're going to switch to the uh, Sega Genesis, also known as the uh, Mega Drive in Japan. Um, out of curiosity, how many people have heard of Magical Hat? I don't believe you. No, I'm, kidding. I hang around I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm the guy who can ask me about Sega Channel. Ah, so. okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, the reason I ask is because this is the Wikipedia page for Magical Hat the Anime. <laughs> it is four pages, is four lines long, and half of those lines are about the game that I'm about to tell you about. So, there's not a lot of people talking about Magical Hat on the internet. That's cruelty. I, yeah, you know what? I agree. Uh, yes. So, Magical Hat was uh, the anime series. Um, the main character's name is Hat. Uh, he's the guy with the Star of David on it. It was basically, it was an action-adventure anime where, you know, you had a, you had an overthrow an evil king. It was okay. Uh, this is what the game looks like uh, on the Mega Drive in Japan. Um, yeah, actually, you know, that, that's a really good-looking screen. So, you might be wondering, when it got brought over to the U.S., you know, what, what could they change it into? You got, like, you got a fantasy adventure game what, what theme could they possibly uh, change it into when they bring it over to the U.S.? Well, how about a horror theme? Yeah, exactly. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is Decap Attack. And to say that this was a complete overhaul from Magical Hat, uh, you'd be right. Um, in this game, you play as a headly, headless mummy named Chuck D. Head. <laughs> he, he is a mummy who has his face in his chest, and he can attack with said face in freaky-looking fashion. You also get a skull that you can throw like a boomerang. And it's, it's a complete graphical overhaul from Magical Hat, to say the least. My mom used to yell at me. Really? Oh. Did she just not like it? Because she thought it was violent. Oh, wow. <laughs> How standards have changed these days. <laughs> yes. Um, there is actually one other major difference between uh, Magical Hat and uh, Decap Attack. If you look in the upper left-hand corner of both screens, you may notice that for Decap Attack, you have a life bar. And in Magical Hat, you have a score because you only have one hit. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, 
Yeah, a decap deck, uh, to my understanding, is the easier game, and it's quite, it's quite interesting one, this one. So yeah, um, you can actually get decap attack on Steam if you're interested, in addition to just you know buying it for the Sega Genesis if you want. It's interesting, very interesting game. Or just get an emulator you want. You could, but I'm not allowed to endorse that. Uh oh, I think I know what this. Hold is. on, don't don't spoil it. It's a good one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Speaking of the Mega Drive or uh, Genesis, depending on which country you're in. Next up, Last Battle. Now, in this game, you play as Azarek. I don't know, I didn't name him. But, yeah, that's a, yeah, it's, a it's an okay cover. Uh, it's, a, it's an open, it's uh, mm. you, you travel around different locations as, uh, similar to how you wouldn't say a game like by Commando. Um, and you go from location to location, and you fight dudes, you punch them with your fists. And, uh, you know, some of you might be wondering, hey, you know, this, this, this game looks kind of familiar, kind of familiar. Well, it, for those of you who haven't been able to figure out what this is yet, uh, I'm going to play a really quick clip, clip from the game to give you a clue of what this originally was in Japan. Yes. Developed and published by Sega, but you know, for like same reason as all these other games, they didn't have the license. They didn't want to use the license, and uh, they got changed to Last Battle. Um, now, the funny thing is, is that apparently, in order to legally be different uh, and not be based on the license, all you have to do is change the character's name and apparently slightly change the color palette of each character. Like I, I, I assure you, these two screens are different in, in color. But there's just different enough so that you know you, know, you can't get sued apparently. <laughs> so yeah. So um, just because I find it amusing, these were chain name changes for uh, Last Battle compared to Fist of the North Star. Um, I don't. It's so weird. Like Hazard. Why would you? That's such an unusual name. Usually they choose like lame names like Mike. <laughs> for video games. <laughs> lame for video games. Azarek sounds like he should be the villain. Yeah, you know, you got, you got a point there. He does sound quite a bit villainous. Um, oh. <laughs> so, despite the fact that most of the changes really aren't that uh, major between the two, uh, the biggest difference between the two versions is that, unfortunately, the American version was censored. So, yes. In, uh, on the top, you see the original Japanese version. Uh, whenever you defeat a dude, his head explodes, and then his whole body explodes into beautiful, gory fashion. But in Last Battle, uh, that is not the case. Instead, when you punch a dude, they just fly across the screen like, wah! <laughs> in a very, very quick, very hilarious uh, fashion. So, yeah. This uh, is Last Battle. Um, there were actually a few uh, Fist and the North Star games that did eventually make it to the U.S. Uh, one is Fist of, Fist of the North Star, Ken's Revenge, Ken's Rage. I can read correctly. This is a highly ironic thing. Ken's Rage is censored in Japan and uncensored in America. Really? Yes. Huh. How times have changed. Yes. Yes, so this game was released for the PS3 and the Xbox 360. And uh, its sequel, Ken's Rage 2, was released for the PS3, Xbox 360, and Nintendo Wii U. Don't forget the... Uh, don't forget the... End. No, 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 no. I know what you're going to say. Trust me. I know. Play along. Alright. Now this is going to be like this. Next up. A little game called Cyborg Hunter for the Sega Master System. Um, this game, uh, funny enough, published by Activision. Um, in this game, 
you play as a uh, cybernetic, you know, enhanced guy. Uh, as you, you have to travel around uh, these bases, you have to uh, fight dudes. Um, and uh, one thing that's actually really interesting about this uh, game is that on the top screen, uh, you have uh, two maps. One is a map of the entire stage that you're in to let you know where your current location is. But on the top uh, left-hand side uh, of the screen, is a radar to let you know what uh, enemies are coming towards you, um, and so it's 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 very interesting because usually in you know side scrollers you have the problem where if you go too fast the enemy will just pop up on screen and surprise you, but this one actually gives you a warning, so that's pretty cool. Um, now in Japan, this is actually Sonic Soldier Boardman. And uh, funny enough, it's based on the TV show, which is the one Sonic Soldier Boardman property that didn't make it to the U.S. According to A and M. So yeah, but the funny thing is, is that um, Sonic Soldier Boardman is you know an anime. It's a Sentai-style sci-fi show where um, you know they gotta go around fight evil, all that jazz. Um, the funny thing is, is that there's virtually very little difference between the two versions, which is good for you if you want to play um, a game without having to import and get a relatively authentic experience. Um, it's bad for me because it makes for a less interesting panel. Um, the, only, the only real change outside of you know, name changes, of course, is that uh, for cutscenes, because they can actually tell who the characters are supposed to be. Um, they just completely redid the portraits uh, to make sure that they are definitely, definitely not the anime characters from the series, so they cannot get sued. So yeah. So, but unfortunately, it's pretty much the same game. So yeah. Moving on. Okay. <sighs> Let's talk about Black Belt. Black Belt, Black Belt, Black Belt. So, I have a problem with, sec with the Second Master System in general, at least in the US. This game, look, the Second Master System has some of the worst <laughs> box art in the history of all video games. Oh, don't forget the uh, wrestling. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, the pro wrestling one where the guy is headlocking his own head. Yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah. It's 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 terrible. I don't know what Sega America was thinking. Like, it's, it's, so many of these games have this white and it's supposed to be blue grid and just just terrible drawings in front of them. It's like. Like, what? Why? I, they, I guess they had a surplus of graphing paper. Oh, it's, good. It's, it's, it's absolutely horrible. Maybe and they hired a guy who did the Mega Man box art. No, no. The Mega Man box art looks good compared to this. Because at least with the Mega Man box art, there's, they actually fill the entire like canvas. Look at there's so much negative space in these games. And, and Black, Black Belt, by far, has to be the absolute worst of the entire Sega Master System. Like, I want to make the, like, I just want to make this clear. Like, back in the day, the internet, like, the internet technically existed back then, but we couldn't really use the internet to find out if a game was good. Like, there was no YouTube. Like, if you're lucky, you had, a, like, a website with, like, text. But for the most part, the only, there was only a few ways to find out if a game was good. If your friend had it, if you had a gaming magazine that could, you know, had reviews in it, but most of the time, you could just go to the store, look at the box art, and decide if the game is good or not, if you want to get it. How many people, in all honestly, looked at this cover and said, Oh my goodness, look, it's a fuck! Clearly, this must be a quality game. I'll take 20. It's, it's unbelievable. Future game. It's, un it's, I mean, it's, it's not even like this is a third party game. This was developed and published by Sega. It, there's no excuse. <sighs> so, anyway, <sighs> this is Black Belt. This is the main character of Black Belt. His name is Ricky. 
<laughs> in this game, you have to save your girlfriend, Kyoto, from... Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's, that's not a joke, that is the name. You have to save Kyoto from the evil Wang. <laughs> No joke. I did not make any of that up. And it's actually, he's actually described as the evil Wang. So, yeah. The gameplay of this game is very simple. You scroll to the right. And you fight dudes in what is apparently a place in Asia. You, and you fight them, you fight a boss, you do that a few more times, that's the whole game. It's very simple. Funny enough, he reviewed poorly. <laughs> but you'll never guess what this game originally was, unless you already know. Fist of the North Star! Oh, yeah! I thought it was Rikio! Yes, that's right. Sega developed and published two Fist of the North Star games, and they changed both of them when they brought them over to the US. Now, look at how much better the title screen is for Fist of the North Star. You got, you got Kenshiro standing there. That lightning, that flashes. That is a flashing lightning as your title screen. He looks awesome. Now, unlike last battle, um, Fist of the North Star actually looks very different from Black Belt. This is the same level that I just showed you in the other day, so, uh, the other uh, slide. So, instead of being in Asia Town, you are, in fact, in a post-apocalyptic wasteland uh, slamming dudes. Slamming um. <laughs> 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 the evil wag. Evil wag. Evil wag. That, I, actually, that, I swear, that was an accident. <laughs> so, um... <clears throat> Hey, look. All right. So the funny thing about Black Belt compared to Last Battle is that, um, unlike Last Battle, uh, Black Belt was not censored. Um, however, um, part of that is probably because in the, Fist of, the Second Master System version of Fist of the North Star, uh, he, there's no blood. Instead, it's kind of hard. To, it's really hard to capture in a screenshot what this is going on. But if you look towards the right side, you might see like random bits and pieces. That's a dude that Kenshiro just messed up. <laughs> when, you, when you beat guys, they just explode into pieces. Just scatter everywhere. And for kid, you know, for kids! Exactly, exactly. And in Black Belt, the same exact thing happens. When you, when you mess up a guy, he explodes into pieces. And apparently he's in New York now? Man, he's, man he must really like this girl that he's trying to save. That is one evil one. <laughs> So yeah, so actually, so, so unlike Last Battle, um, there, like I said, the complete graphical overhaul uh, between the two games, and I guess, you know, by the time they got to releasing Last Battle, Sega kind of realized, you know, we don't have to put that much effort into it, we can just do some slight color changes, that's good enough, you know, we won't get in trouble then, and apparently they didn't, so, you know, that kind of works. And, oh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, oh man. I, okay. I need to apologize. I completely forgot that there was a Fist of the North Star game for the Famicom that did in fact make it over to the US. I, I it's completely slipped my mind. Um, you want to see what it was called in the US? Yes. Oh, I know. I know. Ha <laughs> 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 ha! It was called Fist of the North Star. That's right. Um, for the Nintendo Entertainment System, Fist of North Star was, in fact, brought over to the U.S. pretty much intact. In fact, it was also a game for the Game Boy that, was, that kept the license. And, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, so yes. So yes, so to the person who was trying to point out, perfectly aware. Um, and the, you know, it's, it's, it's really funny. When the Genesis first came out, they were talking about how Genesis does what Nintendo well, apparently, when it comes to Fist of the North Star, Sega does what Nintendo don't. 
Unfortunately, what Sega does is remove all likeness from a Fist of the North Star from their Fist of the North Star games. <laughs> I guess that makes them better in their mind. I don't know. All right. Okay. So, so as you may have noticed, this is in fact not a game based on the anime. But no. Um, but I um, I just wanted to share with you uh, a special little bonus game that I found because uh, this is this is very uh, it's a very interesting uh, game. Just just you know, a quick little thing. So this is a, a No Birdie Try. Uh, it is based on a golfer who is uh, most famous in Japan. Um, and funny enough, it's actually very hard to find a lot of information about this game in English when it's a game based on a golfer only famous in Japan. So when they brought this game over, they kind of realized, well, what's the point of paying for the likeness of a Japanese celebrity for a game that we're releasing in North America that no one's heard of. Because again, he's only famous in Japan. So, for localization, instead of just making a you know boring, standard, generic golf game, because there's like 10,000 of those for the Nintendo systems back in the day, it's crazy. Look it up, it's like, it's like 15 golf games for the NES alone. And they instead decided to go to a different group. What? what? Behold, oh. one of the greatest localizations ever. <laughs> what's, what's better than playing golf? Than playing golf with robots. <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> the funny thing is, is that in terms of like scenery and stuff, the game's the same. The only thing they did was they just took the character players and replaced them with robots. So it's just robots playing normal golf. And if you had any kind of doubt that like I'm lying to you, which I don't blame you, I don't look like an honest person. These are the title screens. <laughs> they look very similar to me. So anyway, that's that's uh, that's make a robot golf. I, I it's I think it's just it's just a funny like footnote in history that we'll probably like never see this again. Though we should. All right, moving on. This one is probably my personal favorite because it's it's one of those things where it's like, really, that's what it was. So this is Street Combat for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Street Combat. You know, it's funny. When I bet when they came up with Street Combat, they were probably thinking to themselves, okay, what is a title that we can come up with that is as legally close as we can get to Street Fighter without getting sued by Capcom? Street Combat. Very generic, very generic name. Funny enough, it didn't take off. <laughs> also, this game is very painfully 90s. <laughs> uh, that would... Iron. I honestly, I, I don't know much about them. So, in this game, you engage in combat in the streets. <laughs> what a novel concept. And occasionally, you engage in combats in locations not in the street. <laughs> oh yeah, oh man, the names, the names for these characters are terrible. They're absolutely terrible. And, yeah. You... <laughs> yeah, so this game features a, a cast of crazy characters that only the 90s can truly produce. It was, it is amongst the long list of 90s fighting games that never took off because, quite frankly, it wasn't that great. However, it is an interesting footnote in history because of what it originally was in Japan. 
I'll give you a hint. It's based on a Shonen series. And the, the original manga was Rumiko Takahashi. Round one half? Round one half. <laughs> This is one, like, similar to Decap Attack, this is one of the more dramatic changes between the two because everything, characters, scenery, we're all changed. Gameplay, completely the same. But if you look closely, and it's, it's kind of hard to tell, but all these characters were replaced with complete sprite uh, rewrites, uh, re redone. It's especially clear on the bottom row here, if you look at the, wep the characters that have weapons on them, it's, wow. it's, they're the same characters, but just completely redone. Also, if you notice, the, the, the guy with the sword in street combat is named G.I. Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Again, someone decided, hey, What's the closest legally we can go with the naming without getting sued? Uh, my favorite is that Yenma was changed to Tyrone for this game. <laughs> which, like, which, by the way, Tyrone, really? It's, some of these names are so... Really. Yes, and for the other half of the cast, here's what they look like also. Uh, Helmut in his uh, hoverboard is probably the most obvious between the two. Uh, also, yeah, Steven, that's, that's, a, that was, that's a name that's going to sell games. At least CJ is a little bit better. So, yeah. CJ is apparently Daredevil. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, that's, that's, that is a very good point. It's like, hey, let's make him look like Daredevil, but not get sued on the lake. Now, the funny thing is, is that uh, the next... Uh, Round one half game that was released for the Super Famicom was also brought over to America. Uh, do you want to see what that game was called? I know this. They actually kept the license. <laughs> yes, it is a random one half hard bell. I apologize for the crappy resolution. Um, it, although the funny thing is, with this cover art, they decided to do a cover art. It's like okay. We want to portray the fact that these characters are in fact Asian, but we don't want to make the cover look anime. So let's kind of make like a weird, not so great cover for it. But yes, um, they actually attempted uh, to make uh, a Ramna game and bring it over to the US. And the funny thing is, the third Ramna one half game was also supposed to come over to the US. And if you see, for this was you know, what the cover art was supposed to be, it actually looks like the anime for once. It took, it took three tries. <clears throat> but unfortunately, they canceled the localization of the game before it got brought over to the US, citing uh, sales of other games as the reason why. Oh well. Uh, to date, um, no other Ronda One Half game has been brought over to the US. Um, if you're a fan of Rubiko Takahashi, there were a couple of Inuyasha games that are brought over, but that's pretty much it. Alright. Oh? Alright. So, next up. Uh, this one I think is like the most interesting. Yes. This is an arcade game named Cliffhanger. Now, I have a question. How many people are familiar with the game Dragon Slayer? All right, quite a bit, quite a bit. For those of you not familiar, uh, Dragon's Lair was a full motion video game uh, released in the arcades with animation created by Don Green. For those who don't know, he's an anim you know, pretty much an animation legend. Basically, these cutscenes would play, and occasionally you'd get a prompt, and you'd have to press the prompt at the right time to go to the uh, new location, or you would just die a death. The game, to say, to say the game was super successful would be an understatement. This game was very popular. There was a sequel, there was a called Dragon Lair 2, there was also another game like this called Space Ace. 
um, you know, at the time, this was a big deal because, you know, they were technically cheating by having it just be cutscenes, but graphics in video games did not look like this at the time. So, oh yeah, I forgot about this part. Um, so when Stern uh, saw the success of Dragon's Lair, they thought, hey, we gotta get on, in on this, because this is big money. Um, however, they didn't exactly want to put the effort into actually, you know, making your own original animation. Put effort and money, why would you want to do that? So anyway. <laughs> I'll let this play when is Dirk going to die? <laughs> <clears throat> I'm afraid I have some bad news. This you is tell from, us, Mr. Barrett. This is from a... Uh, no oh, this is a no death from a... Damn it! <laughs> it, it, it is very simple, but that's... Um, that it's, it's a product, it's very much a product of its time where it's like, in order to achieve this type of, these type of visuals, in order to have it, you know, because even though this was on a laser disc, there was still a lot of like, you know, technical limitations. So in order to get, you know, something that looks this good, you have to keep the gameplay very simple. Because you're, you're essentially, you're playing a movie. You know, people... This is basically quick time event the game. Yes, that is, that is actually a very accurate way to describe it. This, this, this game is just a series of quick time events. Except back then, it was actually cool. Instead of an annoying... And I would dare say this is one of the most influential video games for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, but, you know, they weren't trying to do that, unfortunately. So yeah, so that's Dragon Slayer. So, I'm not going to show you anything from Cliffhanger yet, because it's kind of going to give it away. It's going to give it away. So instead, I am going to describe this game to you. Cliffhanger, you play as a guy named Cliff, in which, I know, funny, in which you have to save a lovely woman named Clarissa from the, Rapio. E from the evil Count Drago. And Cliff, um, he happens to be a thief. And he's also joined by his friend who is this really good marksman. And um, uh, Cliff also has a grandfather who is a thief. And in case you, you haven't figured it out, uh, I'm going to show you what the art on the side of the arcade machine looked like. Sorry, that? <coughs> yes. Yes. I was quite surprised when I saw this too. This is Lupin the Third, the castle of Cagliostro. Hey, movie. <coughs> what they did was they took the footage, they licensed the footage from this movie. They didn't steal it. That would be, that would actually be even funnier if they just stole it. But no, they licensed the footage from the movie and um, they just, they took it, they cut it up, they gave it a really bad dub. They changed the characters' names because apparently Lupin isn't cool, I gotta call him Cliff. And... Actually, I think there were a lot of legal issues. Yeah, those, yeah, yeah, you know what, you're right, the, the whole Arsene Lupin. Like, Streamline license. Pictures also had issues calling him Lupin. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very convoluted thing, you're actually right. Even still, even though Cliff is, the only reason he's called Cliff is because they want the pun. And it's not that great. Uh, so yeah, this is what the arcade machine looked like. Uh, you had a joystick for directional movements as well as the ability to control Cliff's uh, hands and feet. Yeah. And um, yeah, you, you just stand there and play the game. And um, I'm going to play a few clips from the game for you. Yeah, wait a a game that keeps you on the edge of your toes. By controlling the joystick and the action button, you determine the fate of Cliff, a lovable outcast, in his quest to rescue one beautiful, breathtaking lady. But one mistake, and you've blown it. Will Count Draco strike the first blow? 
Will the princess be forced to marry someone she can't stand? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, get stuck in a trap door. Right. Or will our inventive international hero leap to the rescue, only to be caught hanging around again? Whether Cliff continues his fight to give hope to the helpless is in your hands. Good luck. So yeah, so that is, um, so that's supposed to sell you on the game? I'm already sold. That's good, that's good, that's good. So this is uh, from the first level of the game. I apologize for the resolution, it's, it's not the greatest. Jeff! Jeff! represents all uh, the buttons. Oh no! Millions! Trillions! It's perfect! If this is a game that is entirely based on footage that already existed and has nothing original, how do they portray when you mess up and die? Well, I got an example for you, so I'd like to show you. Like, you guys laughed at that. You're like, whoa! Yeah, it's shocking because it's a scene from a completely different Lupin movie. Shh. Hold on. Now, you may, now, for those of you who are familiar with uh, the Castle of Calgary Ostro, um, you may have noticed something about that last scene. You see, that, that death scene is not actually from the Castle of Calgary Ostro. Because, in fact, Cliffhanger is not based on one Lupin the Third movie. It's based on two! <laughs> yes, that's right. In order to have enough footage to create what would be classified as a functional video game, they took scenes from The Mystery of Mano and they just spliced it in. So they, in fact, licensed two Lupin III movies in order to make a game uh, that is a, what was a basic cash grab to, uh, based on the popularity of Dragon Slayer and try to sell it to people on Laserdisc arcade machines. It didn't really work. Yeah. Although, the, a, bit of a, a bit of a trivia for you. Um, the game did get some exposure when it was featured on the classic uh, video game game show, Starcade. Um, I believe the man on the left was actually the winner of that episode. But yes, if, if you look in the background behind the guy in the uh, red shirt, see the machine there, they played it. Um, it's. It's kind of weird uh, playing an FMV game for a game show because, like, you know, unlike you know, like most arcade games, like if you're playing like Final Fight or something, and, you know, there's there's a lot more variability in what you can get to your score. With a game that contains entirely cutscenes, like having a game based on entirely score is a bit weird because it's basically based on who messes up a little bit more in the 30 seconds that you play the game. Um, but also, fun fact, is that when I was uh, doing research about this game, I read that, allegedly, when Discotech re-released the Castle of Cagliostro show on Blu-ray, they actually tried to get the rights to Cliffhanger to put it on the Blu-ray. Yeah, and it's totally, and they, could, they could have done it, because they had the rights to, uh, to Mr. Amaro as well, so it, they could have done it. However, when they reached out to Stern, unfortunately, they could not actually find the contracts that were uh, used to make the game. 
So legally, they could not license it. I know. And, and the real shame about this, because I'm, I'm a big fan of this, like, you know, alternate uh, video game stuff, and eventually, you know, I like to collect these, these sort of things, but unfortunately, Cliffhanger, most of the arcade machines were either destroyed or repurposed for a different game. So the games themselves are actually quite rare. This is a screenshot from eBay yesterday if you were to uh, search for Cliffhanger. You may notice none of these are the actual game. But these are all the things that come up. This is the entire search result for Cliffhanger on eBay. Yeah, um, I, I've, I've done some research in the past uh, looking for the game. Occasionally the cabinets come up, occasionally the laser disc itself comes up, and occasionally you'll get like some marquees or, or something to come up. It's, it's a very rare game, and usually it'll cost a grand if you, if you want the whole cabinet. It's, it's not cheap either. And it's, it's, it, that's why I think it's really tragic that Discotech was unable to get the license to, for the game because I think as weird as like a lot of this stuff is, and you can argue whether or not any of these games should actually exist, they are interesting parts of history and I honestly believe that like they should be preserved. The good news is, is that um, you know, the internet helps preserve things, so certain games will live on forever. So, um, we're actually, I'm actually out of games to show you today. Um, oh, we didn't even get to see Shatterhand. I, I, look, I only have so much time. Um, I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't, you know, there are a few more games that uh, I didn't get to share with you. Um, and there's even, there's even some games where, like, they were based on a license in America, and they got brought over to Japan, they got changed. Like, for example, the Jetsons game, which is a weird thing. But um, these are things that just simply put, don't happen anymore, because these days, anime is more popular than it was back in the 80s. Uh, we have, you know, we have internet streaming, we got pretty much so many, every year, almost every anime from that year gets licensed for home release, and, you know, at the very least in sub form. So whenever they bring over an anime video game to the US, there's no reason not to change, there's no, sorry, there's no reason to change it, because the title's actually known. So, stuff like this just simply doesn't happen anymore. And, you know, and many people say that's a good thing. Because, like, if I want, like, for example, if they bring over One Piece, I don't want them to change the pirates to, like, ninjas and be called, like, Star Force or something. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so, yeah. So, while these games are a very interesting uh, piece in history, I can assure you that stuff like this will just never happen again, period. Um, let's see, how much time we got? Uh, we got a little bit of time. If anyone got any things you like to ask, or just have a conversation about some things? All right, uh, yeah. Did you have, I heard somebody talking about other games that you would possibly recommend for like some extra credit that if you want to go afterwards and try and find some stuff on our own, it will be a good resource or a good place to go. Oh, um, yeah, it's a bit tough, because it's a very specific, it's a very specific topic, and so, it, it, like, doing research, it's kind of hard to be, like, games that were changed in the U.S. from Japan is probably, like, you have to do, like, a Google search for that and just kind of see what other people write, because it's very specific. Um, the only other thing is that, like, if you go to Wikipedia and stuff, um, uh, when you look at like big lists of games, they will list, like, if a game had multiple names, they'll list both of them. So that will give you an indication that there might have been change to it. Um, but yeah, it's actually, this is actually quite a, it's not an easy topic to research, uh, unfortunately. So I know there's a, there's, there's a few that I, um, that I didn't talk about. Like I believe Kid Ninja for the uh, NES is another one, and um, he mentioned uh, Shatterhand. So yeah, there's definitely more to be had, but um, that's, I want to talk about like, you know, some of the very, some of the more interesting ones, and I do think I covered a good portion of it. Uh, yes, the mask. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh. All right. Actually, I had no idea. Okay. Th uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, 
Yeah. Actually, if, if uh, for those of you who are curious, because I, I got I still got a little bit of time. Um, there actually, God damn, sorry. There actually were a few games that were um, uh, anime games that were brought over to the U.S. Uh, intact uh, for the you know, back for the the eight bit and uh, sixteen bit games. Um, Probably the most notable one for me, at least, is for the NES. There was uh, two Goval 13 games that I brought over to the U.S. Yeah, which is so... I find it weird, because, like, Goval 13, you don't think that that was something that'd be unaltered. Um, the game, the first game was censored in the U.S., um, because it had, a, quite frankly, a sex scene in it. And Ted America was like, you ain't keeping that in. <laughs> Technically, it was in. Uh, the, 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 the nudity didn't stay in, that's for sure. Um, also, there was a there's a Street Racer game for the Super Nintendo, and funny enough, um, it's compatible with this exercise bike accessory that is super rare. It, yeah, uh, very. Super Nintendo. Yeah, Super Nintendo. Yeah, control control Speed Racer with a bike. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, so um, I'm gonna wrap things up. Uh, for those of you who like me and want to know more about me, I have a website called 2-2.com. I'm on Twitter at 2 will If you're interested, i got some cards that I can pass out to you. Uh, thank you very much for making my first panel special. Um, thank you. Thank you. And uh, enjoy the rest of your time at IMNX. Thank you, everyone. Hey, I'm going to be